Listen, we're very fortunate today, uh, all of us, that we have uh, someone who's willing to come here, uh, who will not be a stranger to any of you, and speak. Speak to you and help you to learn. We're on this lifelong learning thing. That's why I came. I didn't have to be here today. I came here because I wanted to learn. Even though I've worked for General Mattis in the past, I'm not done learning. So I came to learn something. So if you brought a book and you brought a pen, something to write with, today's going to be a good day because you're going to learn something. So you should, uh, you should take copious notes. Very briefly, thank you to MCCS for putting this together so we can have the opportunity to have uh, General Mattis and Secretary Mattis here to tell us the things that are, uh, that are in his book and probably some other things. Uh, I, I know he, uh, he'll be taking some questions from you and they should be good questions. What I will only tell you in a very brief moment, uh, you've seen uh, General Mattis' bio. He's done pretty much everything he can do from being a platoon commander to being a combatant commander in Central Command and then being Secretary of Defense. So I don't think you can come up with a question that he hasn't experienced or, or, or dealt with himself. Uh, that's not a challenge, that's just a statement. So for all of you that are out here today, again, thank you for being here. And it is a great privilege for me to introduce the former Commanding General of Marine Corps Combat Development Command and the 26th Secretary of Defense, General James Mattis. Wait till I'm done and see if you want to stand up and clap, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's great to be here. In, in all of our lives, some things are work and some things are fun. Let me guarantee you right up front, this is a lot of fun to be back at Quantico. And, and just to show you how deep my roots go for uh, Quantico, about 50 years and three months ago, I showed up here as an 18-year-old, okay? And uh, I came here, uh, I knew little, would be the polite way of putting it about the Marine Corps. And I fell in love with the Marine Corps over the years afterwards. I came in to do a couple years, do my patriotic chore, the draft was on. And uh, then I was going to get out and go home. I was going to teach uh, physics and history, and I was going to coach football. I had my whole life planned. And as uh, John Lennon put it, he said, you make your plans and God laughs, okay? So I, uh, I come back here today uh, with a, a sense of humility. This is where the Marine NCOs, the Vietnam generation, started putting their thumbprint on me. Uh, I come back here with a great deal of affection uh, for the Marine Corps, for all you young men and women today who are truly volunteers for what you have committed, what you have signed, that blank check payable to the, uh, the American people. Uh, with your lives. Uh, I, I feel nothing but uh, pride in what you stand for. Uh, I've read the Commandant's, our new Commandant's uh, guidance. I've read it twice, by the way, and I think the Marine Corps is absolutely on the right track, and I think some of you know I'm outspoken. If there was something I didn't think was right, I would say so. And in fact, uh, I think it's right on target. I enjoy reading it. Line by line, he's laid out something that I found from my earliest days here, and that is the Marine Corps has no institutional confusion about what it stands for. It is going to fight like the Dickens if the enemy ever takes us on, and we're going to fight and prove that it's going to be your longest day and worst day when you take on the U.S. Marines. And that's important in this imperfect world that our diplomats always speak from a position of strength. Uh, right now, you can see the storm clouds gathering. I know some of you young men and women joined to go straight off to war. I recognize that uh, in that sense, uh, you are, thank God, disappointed because I've seen enough of wars. But I would also tell you that you must consider every week in the Marine Corps your last week of peace. You must every week look back and say, I'm more ready for a fight now than ever. And rest assured that while you may be thinking more about weekend liberty, I did when I was young, and you may be thinking a lot more about when you're going to go home for the holidays and that sort of thing, that's all good, that's all good and well for you to be thinking like that. But remember that whether you're interested in war or not, war is interested in every one of you, every single one of you. And if you're not focused on that and preparing yourself for what's coming, and you have to always assume it will come, 
If it doesn't, thank God. You go out, you go to college, you move on. Uh, that's great, but if it does come, you do not want to be saying, gosh, I wish I'd learned more, I wish I'd studied more, I wish I'd put more time on the run course or the obstacle course. You want to make sure that you're at the top of your game. And so I would just come to you with a couple of ideas uh, that went into the book. And why did I write it? It was to pass those ideas on to you. I had no intention of writing a book, to tell you the truth. I got out. And one of the mentors, and we've all had good coaches and good mentors, uh, he sat down with me and said, you know, you've been very lucky. You got the opportunity to fight many times. He said, uh, you've benefited from reading a lot of other people's books. You've obviously um, carried out the Commandant's orders about reading the Commandant's reading list. I said, yes, sir, I have. Uh, he said, you ought to pass it on. And when you get to, at the point in life where you have my color hair, you take a lot more pride in young people's success than your own. You've either done it with your life or you haven't. You either made good choices or you did not. You either learned from your mistakes, and I made many, or you did not. And so at that point, what you want to do, what you feel uh, is a responsibility uh, to pass on to those you have an affection for what you learned and say, hey, this is what worked for me or didn't work. So read this, think about it, and then go out and do your own thing and see if you can't in some way put together a life that you look back on and you're proud of, your family's proud of, and you feel like you left the country just a little bit better, your school district a little bit better, your family a little bit better, you know, you, you, that you're leaving things just a little bit better. I'm not sure my generation is doing that on a strategic level which is another reason I put in some of the larger mistakes in my book so you can look at them critically and say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in that position because we all have a responsibility here. For most of us, most of us, we were born here by complete luck. There was nothing more to it than we were born here. For a higher than uh, average number in our country, average number in our military, excuse me, you immigrated here, your family did, and you chose to be here. We all choose to live in this society. Uh, but we have a responsibility, so luck and choice, but then we have a responsibility to turn this country over in as good a shape or better, and that means your Marine Corps over in as good a shape or better than you received it. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect along the way. In fact, you just have to deal with history. We were not a perfect country. We were born with a defect called slavery that was worldwide. We have done a tremendous amount to overcome that sort of thing, but every generation owes it to the country to always keep the country on the upward trajectory. And that's what you defend when you wear that uniform. You defend this great, big, wonderful experiment that you and I call America. And in this world right now, I learned in the Marine Corps there are people out there who hate this experiment because of the freedom it gives to men and women and the dignity it gives to individuals. Now you'll have some people who say, well, the country's not perfect and it's all messed up. No, it's not all messed up. Matter of fact, take away our border patrol and watch as the rest of the world pretty much moves here to see what would happen uh, worldwide if, if you think that your view of America is one that's kind of on the downside. I've got a story for you, I'll tell you before we go to Q&A, that might cause you to reconsider. But I think it's very, very important that we do recognize that we have got to keep making the Marine Corps better. You can't stall out. You've got to be, start with yourself. You've got to make certain in body, mind, and spirit, you're always improving. Uh, because when you think of what brought you into the Marine Corps, sometimes you can lose some of that along the way unless you keep improving. You'll never stay the same in this world. You either get better or you get worse. It, it would be almost impossible to stay the same as you go through the normal challenges, problems, and satisfactions of life. So always try to be turning over a new leaf and getting a little bit better. It certainly worked for me, and I got in a lot of trouble, frankly. I, got, I, got, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, there were a lot of times when I got counseled uh, very bluntly. It started here in the summer of 1969, I might add by Marine NCOs who were not there to help me through my midlife crisis, if you know what I mean. They were ready to go after me. And after a while, you develop a certain hard core inside you that makes you a stronger 
uh, person in your family, a stronger member of your community, a stronger member of your Marine Corps team, or any corporate team or university team you join after this. So I just recommend you stay proud of yourself. You keep looking forward to a bright future, because if you do, you'll make it a bright future. And don't let anything drag you down underneath. Don't let anybody tell you that you're a victim. Don't let anyone tell you ever that uh, cynicism is something good. All that is is cowardice. When you say, ah, it can't, you can't do any better. Everything's screwed up. Or you say that, you know, something bad happened to me, so I've got to give up, something like that. Attitude is a weapon again, and you've just got to keep the weapon sharp. And if you can do that, there's nothing in life that'll slow you young folks down. Now, I don't want to talk for a while. Believe it or not, I can go through a whole stack of notes here, and I can talk for hours. Any general can. You know what I mean, General Smith? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the bottom line is I want to go to Q&A early because we're also going to take questions from those of you in the audience. Is that beer there? No? He's got a jug, a gallon jug. I'm thinking, guys, <laughs> not that bad, is it? Um, Anyway, uh, what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to go to Q&A. There's an interrogator. She's going to come and interrogate me, I guess. And, uh, and then we're going to take some questions from out there in the audience. And it's going to get really weird if I'm looking at you and you're looking at me and no one's saying anything. So start thinking up some good questions, OK? <laughs> OK, Captain, give it a shot here. Thank you, Secretary Mattis. We'll start with the questions submitted by the audience. What advice would you give to yourself if you were to start your career over again from the start? Okay, if I was to start the career over again, my God, at this age, man. <laughs> now, if I was, if I was uh, at a young age and coming in again, first of all, I'd do it. Uh, I don't know if I'd have stayed 43 years. That's a long time, isn't it? Uh, but I'll tell you, I, I'd do it again because I've always felt sorry uh, I wouldn't say it to them, but I always felt sorry for somebody who'd never been in the Marines. You know what I mean? I mean, can you imagine never having been through that boot camp, never having been through the, uh, the kind of uh, criticism that a captain can give you when you don't measure up, that sort of thing. Uh, to give you an example, I was here, uh, it was at my second summer. It was, I was at Officer County State School for two summers, two meters class, split in half. I'm over here at Officer Kane School down Main Site, down at the uh, Chapawamzik area, and we are running one platoon against another competition on the obstacle course. And so I was, I was the first guy of my platoon going, and their guy was going. And by the time I was running down the logs, you know what I mean? I knew I was going to beat this guy. I, just, I knew it. I was way out in front. And so I was going, I went over the wall. God, I didn't even hear him hit the wall, and I was already over the next thing. Uh, the double bars and all. And so I, I was kind of, I was cocky, you know, I, I don't have to give 100% here, I'll just keep going. I went up the rope, tapped the rope, dropped back down, and man, this gunnery sergeant, Collier, I still remember his name, standing over me. Uh, he looked like seven feet, 10 inches tall, and he was screaming in my face, saying, basically, he thought I was a communist sent in to sabotage the Marine Corps, you know? <laughs> and he said, you slowed down, you weren't given 100%, so I'm 100% dissatisfied with you, and this is gonna be the worst day of your life, and he's going after me. And he said, if you ever give only 99% again, I'm gonna kill you, and I believed it. <laughs> and boy, t but the lesson is here, if I had to do over again, uh, I wouldn't even have gone through that. That was, that was a, quite an event, uh, you call it a traumatic event. I think PTS wasn't a big deal in those days. But I think I would have been in PTSD, you know, I could have said, hey, I'm raising my hand, I need time out or something. Um, <laughs> but bottom line is, wherever you're at, give 100%. And something he said later, before I graduated, he'd actually been my platoon sergeant at Camp Upshur two years before, so he knew me pretty well. And he pulled each of us aside before we left. And on me, he said, I know, I know you've done well, and, and you know, you, you, you've learned some lessons here, but he said, you just remember the difference between giving 99% and 100% is only about 1% of effort. It's additional 10 minutes one day. He said, it's not a big difference, but it's 100% difference in how the Marine Corps is gonna look at you. So I think I would pass on to all of you that you be a totus porcus Marine. You didn't know I could speak Latin, did you? 
That means whole hog, okay? Totus porcus, you get it? You, you give it 100% every day, and you actually get more enthusiasm. You don't do things just enough to get by. You always set your standard even higher. You know, if you're doing 100%, you're maxing the PFT, then try to get in that extra pull up for chesty. Always do more, and while you're doing that, make sure you're helping the Marine on your left or right, the sailor on your left or right, who's having a tough day or not quite as good physically or having trouble, you know, getting their first aid skills up, whatever it is. Because if you start doing that too, what's called putting others first, you'll never have many problems in your life. You'll always be thankful for your problems when you start helping others. So those would be the two things that I learned. And I learned it by watching other Marines or again, having a gunnery sergeant explaining about my background and my parentage for going too slow. Okay. What practical habits did you employ at each stage of your career to prepare for the next level of leadership? To prepare for the next level of leadership. I think we all watch the people above us and we often watch them more critically than anyone else, you know, because they're carrying our, our fates with them. I mean, I was an infantry officer for those 40 odd years and very quickly uh, you learn from those who are your leaders. But in my case, uh, there were some things I picked up from my first three platoon sergeants. Now, a platoon in the infantry has got about 41 sailors and Marines, approximately, good day. Actually, sometimes we had more than that at times in the old days because the Marine Corps was coming down in size and we had extra, actually had more Marines than we needed for the size units we had. And my first three platoon sergeants who were supposed to be staff sergeants, my first one was a corporal, the second one was a corporal, my third one was a staff sergeant. First one was... Uh, Corporal Wayne Johnson, a British immigrant from the British East Indies with a name like that. Of course, we all called him John Wayne. You know, we get it, Wayne Johnson, John Wayne. Um, but what he showed me was, as a second lieutenant, brand new, fresh out of Quantico, he said, it's as important what you put in your orders to the troops as what you leave out. And I'd never heard that before I got there. He said, only tell them what you absolutely need to tell them to do and then leave the rest to them. And it was a very interesting comment. I was 21 years old, he was 21 years old, and here was a corporal explaining to me that what I leave out of what I'm telling people to do is as important as what I tell them. The next platoon sergeant I had was Corporal Manuel Rivera, a green card holder from Mexico. And Corporal Rivera's point was to always come down as close to the line as I could come as an officer that had to separate officers and troops, but never surrender one ounce of my authority. He said, one of these days, Lieutenant, you'll need it all. Don't, don't become friends. Don't become uh, like, you know, like uh, giving up authority or something like that. He was very stern, but he would always take people who were having trouble off by themselves, and he would talk to them in private. And Copa Rivera's point was, that everybody needs a coach, nobody needs a tyrant. And he was very authoritative, he made very clear he was a corporal, and he, he would brook no nonsense from anyone else. Uh, but at the same time, they saw this tough, very almost aristocratic corporal go off and work with them privately where they were having trouble on whatever it was, liberty, conduct, uh, they mouthed off to somebody when they were on guard duty. You know, we, had, we had some discipline problems back in the early 70s, but he was just unrelenting. He would never give up on a guy. If we had a guy in the brig, he'd go down and meet, him, meet with him in the brig at least once a week on Liberty time. He'd go down to the brig and check him with some other NCOs. He'd let him sit down and talk to the guy in the brig. So that was a really interesting coaching example I got from him. And then I got a staff sergeant, Remy Lebrun. See, I still remember these names some 50 years later. Um, they were, that's how much impact they had on me. And Staff Sergeant Lebrun was from Quebec, Canada. Again, a green card holder. And Staff Sergeant Lebrun's point was that you always had to bring people together and clarify they understood what you wanted them to do. He said, look, Lieutenant, they don't weigh away. I'd gotten chewed out one Monday morning because my rambunctious young guys had done what you know, rambunctious young grunts do sometimes over the weekend. And he said, look, Lieutenant, the troops really don't lay awake at night looking at the ceiling thinking, how can I screw up Lieutenant Mattis's day tomorrow, okay? <laughs> they really don't do that. 
But he said, at the same time, you have to make very clear before they go on liberty what you want and what you don't want, you know? So I finally figured out how to actually clarify clearly what it is needed to be done. And as I got better at that, he taught me how to let my hands go off the steering wheel because I'd said what I want done. And if you keep coaching your young folks, your young Marines, then presto, they're gonna take care of it. And you gotta remember, especially as an officer, you never win one battle on the battlefield. The only battle you win is for the trust and the respect of your troops. They win all the battles. <clears throat> and so that's the way I prepared for higher rank, was having, in this case, subordinate leaders, junior leaders teaching me as an officer, what do you do and what do you not do? Does that answer your question or do you want to come back at me here? Yes, sir. Uh, what do you consider to be the greatest challenge for future leaders? Biggest challenge. Fallujah. Probably Fallujah, I guess, Eric, where I almost got him shot, by the way. Well, you did get shot, just didn't get killed. Um, <laughs> as you can see, you know. Um, but it's pretty wonderful to get shot at and missed, in my case. You know, you didn't have that opportunity. You got shot. Um, yeah. So uh, your commanding general and I, a bunch of us were over in Iraq, and we uh, turned over with the 82nd Airborne. We'd been called back on short notice. We just left probably 90, some of our units were just left Iraq 90 days before, and we got the word we're going again. Now, number one, this was a division that had had troops in Afghanistan the Christmas of 2001. We deployed during the Christmas season of 2002, uh, it's now 2003, we've been off to war, we're back now, we've been back no more than 90 days, and the advanced elements had to go again. So right away, we were well served by the NCOs and junior officers whose social energy kept everyone's spirits in there. I mean, three holidays in a row, and we don't even know how long we're going in for. They couldn't even tell us how long the tour would be initially. So we head out there, we turn over to the 82nd Airborne, and they warn us Fallujah is going to be very, very bad that it's going wrong in this town, and they, they didn't have enough troops to deal with it. We actually were short of troops as well. Uh, we're fighting all over this area. To give you an example, during this period, I had 29 sailors and Marines in my command group that traveled all over the, the ground with me. And over the next four months, 17 of those 29 lads would be killed or wounded around me. I'm a general, I'm not even in the tough fighting, but I'm at 50, over 50% 50 casualties. Give you an idea how bad it was for the infantry there. And this is during the same period your CG got shot. Um, so it's a tough time. And during this period, they caught four contractors who decided to not check in with the Marines uh, and just go into a town called Fallujah. They got caught, killed their bodies burned and desecrated and hung from a bridge for all the international community to see on BBC, CNN, all the news networks around the world were showing it. Uh, we determined at that time what we were going to do because it was a tribal town. We'd work with the various tribes that hated the ones who had done it, find out who did it. We'd get the bodies back, return them to their loved ones. And then we'd send out teams to kill, to make raids and kill the people who had done this. They were on TV, we had pictures, we had people in the town that would give us their names and where they lived because they hated them. So we, that's what I wanted to do. And we were starting this and I got ordered to go to assault the city of 350,000. <coughs> there were a lot of terrorists in the town. Didn't want to do that, I wanted to do it my way. Uh, but I was ordered to do it, so we evacuated the city and we, uh, we attacked in and it was going, I was able to pull other battalions from the Syrian border and eventually we had them contained and we were probably, I don't know if it was two days or four days or six days, but they, had, they were running out of ammo. It was getting uh, good for us. In other words, we'd attack a house, they'd fire a few rounds, the Marines would break in, they didn't have enough ammo, uh, they'd kill them. Uh, it was going very well for us and I get the word, the only thing I said, was <clears throat> when I said, I don't recommend you do this. <clears throat> and they said, you, you, know, they, you know, that's why they call them orders, like 
you're not liked, right? You know, what you don't have to like it, they're ordering you to do it. So deep inside the city, and I told them, now don't stop me, but they ordered us to stop. And now I've got my lads in house to house fighting, flipping grenades back and forth and shooting. And now I've got to negotiate. And then there came a point when we were ordered to pull back. <clears throat> and at this point, this is, a, this is, when you're a general, this is the worst possible thing. Because you've put your guys on the line, you've lost sailors and Marines going into this fight, uh, and now you gotta pull back. And one of our young Lance Corporals, filthy, dirty, machine, light machine gunner, uh, just did a blonde haired kid from down south, filthy all over. He's got his machine gun over his shoulder and they're pulling back. And he gets a, a news camera shoved in his face. And the only guidance I ever gave the division on uh, public affairs stuff was show them everything we're doing. If what we're doing can't see the light of day, we shouldn't be doing it. But make sure you share your courage with the world. Do not start sucking your thumb and talking about how bad it is. I never gave him any more guidance than that. And so the camera guy has it up there and the news reporter, he's saying, oh, you must feel terrible. This is terrible. You're ordered to pull out after you've lost some of your buddies. And he was in an assault unit. I mean, he, he certainly had lost some of his best friends. <clears throat> but he said, they said, uh, this must tell you the worst thing. It's terrible. You must feel terrible. How do you feel? You know, you've already told them what, what the storyline is they want to record, you know. And he's a slow-talking kid from down south. He got a piece of grass stuck in his mouth. And he just looks into the camera and said, it doesn't matter. We'll hunt him down somewhere else and kill him. <laughs> but there's a Marine. You see what I mean? No sucking his thumb. No saying, oh, yeah, poor me. I'm going through a midlife crisis. Some reason he kept, he kept faith with his chain of command. <clears throat> I know I had my three-star Marine commander's support for doing it my way and not stopping once we're in there. The Army three-star was with me. The CENTCOM commander, General Abizade, he was with me on it, but we got overruled. That, we have civilian control of the military. That's the way it is in America. That's the way we want it in America. And then we did hunt him down somewhere else, and we did kill him, okay? So my, my point is, uh, bad things happen in your life and in my life. Bad things happen to that Lance Corporal, and bad things happen to a lot of other people, including Gold Star families. But we can all choose our attitude how we're going to respond to it. We don't have to start sucking our thumb. We don't have to start getting like victimhood or poor little me. We don't have to start thinking everything's all screwed up. No, it's not. Read your history. There's been a lot worse things than that happened. And the Marines got out a chosen reservoir in one piece when they said, this is not smart to go into those mountains with our flanks open. But when 1st Marine Division got caught there, they came out and shattered eight enemy divisions on the way out just as a thank you to them. So you never, you never as a Marine are a victim. You never as a Marine uh, start wimping out. That's just not that you're either a wimp or you're a Marine. You know, you, you're not, you can't be both, you know. So worst day. That was one of the worst days I had, and Lance Corporal turned it into one of the best days in terms of the attitude that seeped back into the division. And just, we were on our way, and, and we had very good hunting uh, as we went after him. <laughs> what else? In your book, you state the cataclysmic events of 1979, which caused the tectonic shift still felt today. Could you elaborate on how these events changed the strategic global environment? Uh -huh. Okay, 1979, I'm, I'm out in the Mideast, I'm an infantry company commander. Uh, president Carter, this is how long ago it was, President Carter was our president at the time, had sent us out there because the Russians had moved into Afghanistan, first thing that came back to impact all of our Marines in here. Uh, they turned the Afghan society upside down, they murdered people, they tore the society's fabric apart from the tribal nature of it, and by the time they're done, they had opened the door to the terrorists that eventually used it as a launching pad to come after us on 9-11. Same year, uh, Khomeini took over in Iran, and he led a revolutionary regime, and this is a regime that has chanted death to America every Friday at their Friday prayers ever since then, okay? That's the way they are. They're not the Iranian people. Our problem is not the people of Iran. They are held hostage by this regime. And it, to this day, as you know from the news in the last couple of days, we're having all these problems with Iran. 
It's with the Iranian regime that goes around murdering former Lebanese prime ministers, tried to murder, believe it or not, the Saudi, Ameri Saudi Arabian ambassador to Washington, D.C., less than two miles from the White House a couple years ago, with a car bomb, no less. So that's the kind of regime it is. That's what Khomeini hosted in. So in 1979, Soviets invade Afghanistan, turn the society upside down. Khomeini comes in and takes over in Iran and now starts promoting a group, Lebanese Hezbollah, that declare war on us in 1982. 1983, the French paratrooper barracks and the US Marine barracks in Beirut are attacked and we have done precious little to stop the Lebanese Hezbollah side of the terrorists. We've gone after Al-Qaeda, but not this other side. <coughs> and then I think the third, well, the, uh, the oil prices shoot up, you know, it, around that time. And at that point, they've got plenty of money to fund terrorists. And the Grand Mosque is seized by a bunch of nutcases and French special forces and the Saudis go in, but at great cost and casualties, they retake the mosque from the fanatics. Those ripple effects are still being felt today, obviously, from Syria and Lebanon to Yemen and Saudi Arabia, from Afghanistan all the way into Egypt and Israel. Is that what you were driving at? Does that answer the question? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, next question, what was your biggest leadership challenge while serving on active duty? Say that again. What was your biggest leadership challenge while serving on active duty? You know, I don't think I ever had any challenges. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the Marines, here's what the Marines do. They train you. You know, we all know <clears throat> when we come out of uh, training how to shoot a machine gun, how to put a, a wound dressing on, you know how to patrol, <coughs> excuse me. Um, hmm. What they do is they educate you for the things they don't know. You know what I mean? In other words, you have to be educated to handle the things that, uh, that they can't enter. They know you need to know how to fire a machine gun. And so you have to do that common sense reading for the other. I don't think I ever had any big leadership challenges. I mean, the Marine Corps had prepared me for them, you know? I mean, it, it, I'm, I was not, you know, one thing, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, didn't, I never thought I'd be standing up here, okay? When I was your age, I was coming in to do a couple years in the Marine Corps. I'm a pretty average Marine. And, and people say, no, you're just being modest. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm a very average Marine. Okay, physical fitness came kind of easily to me. And I learned after a little while, you better really read those books on the Commonwealth Reading List, because I had officers who were rather abrupt with me if I wasn't up on my reading. And then any time we went through something that was challenging, if you ever showed a lack of Marine Corps spirit, well, you heard about that too. So it was, you could deal with whatever challenges came your way and they didn't seem all that difficult uh, because we were well prepared for them. <coughs> And the last question from the audience submission, sir. What techniques have you found to help facilitate thinking at the most effective level? Facilitate what? Facilitate thinking? Facilitate, hmm. Let me turn around. What, tell me how you'd answer that. <laughs> no, no, give it a chance. You're not here to hear me talk, sir. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, uh, one of you, one of you guys in this camouflage uniforms down here. One of you, how would you answer it? <coughs> Go ahead, we got, we got a microphone here. One of you tell me how you'd answer that. We're gonna have some fun now. Good afternoon, sir. Sergeant Marin. Can you read the question, ma'am? <laughs> what tactics have you found to facilitate thinking at the most effective level? Thinking at the most effective level? Uh, for me, on a personal level, obviously, when it comes to tactics, I like to approach my leadership for it. Uh, there are, like you said earlier, sir, there are a lot of people that I look up to, a lot of mentors that I have right now, and hopefully more in the future, that I look up to a lot. Whenever I come across issues that I, um, 
Where I need to facilitate thinking, I talk to them about how to approach the situation in a professional manner and how to avoid certain mistakes that um, they have probably made. And then they teach me on how to uh, properly uh, address the situations with junior Marines as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's exact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, I, I think that goes to the heart of it right there. You know, the, the point I want to make here is, be, as a leader, there's enduring things. And if you were in my shoes, you would still be applying the same leadership principles that you've been taught, and you just apply them on a different level. And so an answer like that is as appropriate as one from a retired four-star general who happened to have another job even after being a four-star general, okay? So very good. Uh, I, I would not uh, embellish that a bit. I would go right with that. That's on target. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> now who else has a question? <coughs> and you can just shout it out if you want, and I'll repeat it, okay? So who's got one? This is going to get weird again if we're looking at each other. There we go. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm sorry, Jackson. Um, I had a kind Drop of... Drop it down just a little. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if it will be controversial in a way, sir, but um, mostly for Marines like myself um, who joined when the war in Afghanistan was still going on, um, when it slowly ended and died out, a lot of the things that the Marine Corps wanted was us to be in a way more professional with the way that I guess um, we would handle situations more like written counselings rather than verbally or more assertively handling our troops. Um, not in a way that would be hazing, but more in a way that would uh, just train them and so they can learn from their mistakes rather than trying to, I guess, let them feel like they're gonna ruin their career. Do you feel like the Marine Corps is going in the right direction with being more professional and being more calm how we approach things or the way that war say that time, Say the last part again, going the right way with. With the way that the Marine Corps is, I guess, necessarily going with, we should have more writtenly and we should be a little bit more calm or should we still be more hard and assertive, I guess, in a way, sir. You mean um, Navy or Army type missions? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, but just more of uh, being allowed to do take certain the, things. Take the mic. Just talk to me here. Yeah. So, Say it again. So just being able to handle situations like Sergeant Down with us rather than constantly, I guess, feeling like our staff and CEOs are taking hold of the situation instead of letting us still be leaders. Yeah. Um, the, reason, uh, the reason why at times that happens, go ahead and grab a seat, sorry. The reason that happens at times <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's once in a while uh, young leaders make mistakes. Well, let me tell you, I made more mistakes than any of you. And what you have to do is look at how do you solve that problem. Most of the time I found I had to do a better job of coaching. In other words, I hadn't set the young leaders up right. Uh, you know, they, we'd find hazing going on, for example, and all of a sudden say, there's not going to be any more of that. And frankly, I don't know where that came from, because when I first came in, that would have lasted about two seconds under the Vietnam NCOs, uh, and they'd have put an end to it, I guarantee you. There would have been no hazing. You don't do it. <clears throat> they were very blunt. They were, uh, they were not kumbaya kind of guys. But the idea that they would allow anybody to haze somebody after the commandant said, you're now a Marine, you're through boot camp. Boot camp is one thing, and we leave that alone. But when it comes to, uh, comes to the rest of you, once you've got that Eagle Globe and Anchor, that, that silly stuff from Hollywood movies is over. And we're not going to buy into that. So what you have to do is you have to earn it. And I think most of all, in a, in a unit, I don't care if you're a general or a captain or a gunny or a sergeant or a lance corporal, your personal reputation will very quickly earn you certain respect and confidence or not, you know? Uh, if it's the guy who's always whining all the time and because he's been around a long time and he made the cutting score, he makes corporal, he's not suddenly going to be seen differently other than the whiner, the guy who whines all the time. So especially with young NCOs, I think we have to do a better job of coaching you about what are the parameters left and right and what needs to be brought up to a higher level. Uh, be, but then, then give you that authority down at your level. <clears throat> but it, it is very easily, because you haven't been in the Marine Corps long, you can make a bad, bad mistake, okay? I got that. So what you tell the young NCOs is, 
<clears throat> you play the midfield. You don't get to run the sidelines. You stay square in the middle of the field. You know what I mean in American football? You stay right in the middle. Now you make a mistake. You're not out of bounds. If you start running the sidelines and you make a mistake, you're going to step out of bounds. And that's when this sort of thing gets imposed. So what we have to do is explain we're not being easy on people by playing the midfield. You can still throw, you know, tough challenges at people below you. But again, nobody needs a tyrant. Everyone needs a coach or a mentor. No one needs a tyrant. You know, especially you young folks who have all volunteered and done this voluntarily. I'm really, uh, I don't, I consider a Marine's spirit, a Marine's pride to be as important as a rifle range score when you go into combat. And so you gotta be careful there that you don't end up crossing lines and then the staff NCOs lose the authority to give you those, those decisions, okay? It's a challenge, but that's because the Marine Corps is a very youthful organization and we need to really teach the young corporals and sergeants how to use their authority and just as importantly, how not to. But it's a very good question. Who else has got one? Yes, sir. <clears throat> good afternoon, sir. Go ahead. Former gunnery sergeant of the Marines, Bill Aycock. How you doing? Um, so my question is, you've seen both sides of the Department of Defense as I have, 34 years, 21 years Marine Corps, 12 years in the DOD. And my question is, is could you talk about your perspectives of what you've seen and where you see the Department of Defense going yeah. from the perspective of in uniform and in civilian you know, yeah. aspect? Yeah, it's a good question, ladies and gentlemen, because with civilian control, the military, like my staff when I was Secretary of Defense, now this isn't my personal staff, but it's over 3,000, okay? These are the ones who make rules about manpower or budgets <clears throat> rules about uh, policy with China or something. It's a big staff. Almost uniformly, the people in those jobs could get out and make a lot more money in the civilian world. Almost uniformly. They are there like you because those of you in uniform, because they believe in the country and believe because <clears throat> they don't want to be in a position of saying, I never did anything for the country. The difference is that in imposing civilian control of the military, it's making certain that both sides are talking to each other enough, I think, Gunny, to make sure it does not become a one-way street. Uh, remember this, even at the top levels, there's a challenge to this. If, uh, for example, when people run for political office to be elected president, for example, they run on health care and they run on things like education, all the things, you know, good highways, all the things we want in our country. And then into the situation room comes the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right now General Dunford, U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, in comes the Secretary of Defense and they say, and the Secretary of State, the CIA, and we say, uh, tap you on the shoulder, I know you really want to do a lot on health care. Let me tell you something, you better do something about this or we're going to be attacked by terrorists. So there is a tension between the civilian political leadership and the military that is natural and is healthy. It is good for us. We don't ever want to become a country so focused on enemies and military things that it becomes a militaristic country. But at the same time, what did our founding fathers set up? To defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But look at the order they put them in. First came life, then came liberty, then came the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit, not the guarantee, by the way. Um, so when you sit down in a, in a room like that, you have to try to make them understand through, hi I use history, the Marine Corps reading list came back to help. So I depersonalized the disagreements or the prioritization. So they didn't feel like I was attacking them. I was trying to show them if we don't do something about this now, then we've got a problem. Now, how did I do it? Uh, when I flew into Washington to be Secretary of Defense to go through Senate confirmation, <clears throat> I heard that Rex Tillerson, the guy who was nominated to be the Secretary of State, was, going, was staying in a hotel nearby in Washington, D.C. Called him up, introduced myself, said, let's get together. I think we may be working together. So two old guys went out to a, uh, out to a restaurant. We're sitting in the back of the restaurant. I'm finding out his dad delivered milk in a, in a truck in a neighborhood. 
Uh, he worked his way through college, became an engineer, Eagle Scout and the Boy Scouts, and rose to be the CEO of one of the biggest corporations in America, ExxonMobil. Me, three years of college, Columbia Basin, you know, went into the Marines because I wasn't a good draft dodger, didn't want to be in the Army, you know? <laughs> so I chose the Marine Infantry. Real smart, huh? <clears throat> and uh, bottom line is, I said, you know, over many years, the State Department and Defense Department haven't gotten along. We've had Lance Corporals pay a price for that. You know, I said, I think we've militarized our foreign policy. I want you in charge of foreign policy. I'll tell you all about the military factors, but then let's you and I go into the White House together, not go in and have to have them sorted out between us. I mean, just reached over that big Texas hand to his, and we shook hands. And every week after that, we'd be on the phone two, three times. We'd have breakfast together once a week. And you, have, you can actually make that divide work for you, is my point, by simply saying that you're going to work as a team player with the State Department so our diplomats are always the strongest diplomats in the world. It comes down to trust. Can you build trust across civilian military lines, across Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine Corps lines, across allied lines? And that's what it comes down to. Can you build trust? With trust, you can do anything. Without it, forget it. You can't do anything, you know? And that's the way you just have to look at the civilian military piece of it and the two sides of DOD. Just build the trust. Ross, Answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Afternoon, sir. I was in the Army for six and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> What has your experience with military working dogs, and have you seen the war dog exhibit at the museum? Yeah, the military working dogs. What a great question. Um, what happened was when we first went into Afghanistan, uh, rapidly we became aware that we needed the dogs back. And anyone who's read about military working dogs uh, really believed in them, of course. Matter of fact, the statue to military working dogs, as you know, is right here at Quantico, Virginia. Um, and so what we did was, uh, I'd seen this advertisement where a guy and his dog are sitting on a couch watching a football game. He looks over at his dog, a dog looks at him, the guy nods, a dog goes in, opens the refrigerator, grabs a beer and brings it to him. <clears throat> I said, I think that's the kind of dog we need in this outfit. <laughs> so. Uh, we put the word out that we needed the dogs, uh, and quickly we began getting them. This is during the Iraq fight now, and the working dogs were tremendous. They saved lives. The initial ones we had spoke uh, Hebrew. Uh, they were from Israel, so we had Marines telling to go left and go right over the little radio collar there uh, in a foreign language, but eventually between Auburn University and the Air Force <clears throat> uh, School and everything for it, uh, those dogs came in, and, and they've proven their weight in gold. I mean, they've been wonderful. I, I'm convinced the dogs think that they're just, that we are just elongated and very cunning dogs ourselves, you know, how to get food out of the cupboard. They, they, <laughs> they seem to really, I, I, I've seen the dogs and the Marines sleeping right alongside each other after a patrol. The dogs know when they walk through the wire, they're off duty and they can chase a tennis ball. But when they go out, their, their attention to duty has been phenomenal. Now, some of them, of course, you always get your 10% that don't work out. And some of them went off, ran off with a poodle or something, went UA, honestly. <laughs> uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, the dogs were wonderful. I, I, and the people who handled those dogs fell in love with the dogs. I mean, they're just the most selfless, capable. By the way, we, according to DARPA, we could not find anything that worked even 3% as well as dogs from technology, give you an idea how it, we evaluated it. Did you handle dogs? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're wonderful, aren't they? Yeah. God, I mean, they saved so many lives, and we lost some. We lost some doing it, too. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. I came here from Camp Lejeune, I was at my advanced school, and right now we're learning about near-peer threats and movement away yeah. from counterinsurgency. My question would be, sir, 
how would you adapt and change the tactics that you've seen from near peer to counterinsurgency? What would you change and what would you do different? Go on to near peer. Okay, the question is, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving away from counterinsurgency as the primary threat. Go ahead and grab a seat, Cole. Um, <clears throat> what, what we're doing right now is recognizing that terrorism is going to continue. We're going to have to continue to fight it. So when I got to the Secretary of Defense position, I decided we needed a new problem statement. And the problem statement is this. How do we maintain a safe and secure nuclear deterrent so those weapons are never used <clears throat> and be able to fight a near-peer conventional enemy so they don't want to take us on? In other words, prevent that. But at the same time, we've got to be, have troops prepared to fight in irregular warfare, which can be everything from guerrilla warfare or insurgencies like we fought against to uh, mixing in cyber, that sort of thing. And I think that uh, the, diff the biggest difference for you young Marines is you've got to be able to fight without a connection to other people. You've got to learn how to fight when you do not have radio communications with a higher or supporting unit. There's ways to do it. We used to practice it during the Cold War. It's, uh, it's harder, it's slower, it's sloppier, it's more wasteful, but you can continue to fight. Right now, we need to change the way we train all of you young folks so that you can use your initiative and aggressiveness, which is why, <clears throat> going back to your earlier question, young NCOs have got to be trained in the future to the level of probably our junior officers today. And junior officers are going to have to be trained to a higher level to understand how they should be thinking so they can be guiding units even when they can't call the higher headquarters. <clears throat> and I think that's the biggest difference will be that you will not have the ability to get a hold of supporting people, but you can still get supporting arms. There's still ways to get it. We used to practice it during the Cold War, but we've got to get back to that. You will still have to fight terrorists. That's all there is to it. Terrorism is going to continue. It's an ambient threat like the light in this room. And until, they, uh, until we stop creating conditions that sprout terrorism, then we're going to have to buy time by fighting it. That's mostly intellectual. If you have your basic done, what we used to call brilliance in the basics, fire movement, first aid, all this sort of thing, then whether you're fighting a near peer threat or an insurgency at the point of contact, it's probably not a lot different at the point you actually go in to the intimate killing range of the enemy weapons. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Secretary, we probably have time, I think, sir, for two questions, and I'd like to steal one of them, if I could, sir. Can I sneak in in front of you? Okay. Yes, yeah, you're, I, you're next. I think you ought to let him do that, young man, if you want to see a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a so, uh, sir, open-ended question, but, but your thoughts on the importance of allies and partners as we go yeah. into peer competition or into the unknown in the future. Your thoughts on our, our need for and our weakness and strengths with allies and partners? You know, naval forces, by their very nature, find it easier to work with allies, just by their very nature. The U.S. Navy, when it goes in to a foreign port, knows it's in a foreign land and has to be put their best foot forward. Marines, when they land, you know, off amphibs in a foreign country, you're guests in their country. So from our youngest days, we were brought up in the Marines, in the Navy, with this idea that you work with others. There's a former Secretary of State I work right alongside now, and she's out at Stanford University where I work, Condoleezza Rice. <clears throat> and the way she put it is, you do things with allies, not to allies, okay? Like, they don't like being humiliated in public, they don't like... Uh, like it when we walk in and I, we know all the answers. I used to tell my American officers when I was a NATO Supreme Commander that not all the good ideas come from the, the country with the most aircraft carriers. Listen to the others. Uh, so I think we're attuned to it in the Navy and the Marine Corps. I'm not so sure in other parts of our military we are as respectful of what other allies bring. I'll give you an example. At our 1st Marine Division headquarters, when you and I were together out there, General, <clears throat> our headquarters was, was guarded by Tongan Marines, Tongan. 
And I went down. They'd sent the commander of their armed forces. They only have a battalion of armed forces. They sent him and about, I think it was about 65, the small group out. <clears throat> now, could they go out and move, shoot, and communicate, and call artillery fire, and bring in jets as good as our Marines? No, they couldn't. They, they were more into fisheries, patrols, and things that, for their nation, you know, the normal stuff. that They exist to serve their nation. And I asked them, why are you here? And they said, because of World War II, because what you did for us in World War II. Now, I wasn't alive in World War II, but they didn't forget, okay? So they're out there, and they may not have been able to do that, but they saved me 65 U.S. Marines who otherwise would have guarded the 1st Marine Division command post, and now I had more Marines out in the field where our guys were outnumbered at this time. And they were as kind and gentle pulling our wounded off vehicles when we'd come back through the wire as you could ever find. They were great Marines. They were proud to serve with the U.S. Marines. I think that it's often difficult for you to know how much confidence that you Marines bring when we go to another country. I, I remember a unit in, in one country that couldn't fight its way out of a paper sack. And we brought in a couple of Marine platoons and we sprinkled one of those platoons into this one unit. And I went actually on patrol with them at one point. And it was amazing how often these troops, who were somewhat scared and a little nervous about going against the enemy, would glance over at the Marine who was walking alongside. They just kept glancing over, and it was like they were finding their manhood, that they could do it. So it's, it's a, a message that we can bring, because we, kept, we are not strong enough, we are not big enough as a military to handle all the problems in the world that could threaten our country. But with allies, we can do it. And so at times we will put, for example, right now we have 3,000 airmen, soldiers, and Marines, and sailors in the Lake Chad Basin area of Africa, working with about 10,000 French Foreign Legion, airborne paratroopers, and French Marines. <clears throat> and they are bringing in around 70,000 African troops, and they are fighting Boko Haram. So basically, for an infusion of 3,000 of our troops priming the pump, we're getting you know, tens of thousands of other troops fighting an enemy that needs to be fought. These are the guys who take over that, took over that girls' school a while ago. We never saw those girls again, by and large. They're slaves, basically. Uh, these guys need to be fought. They, frankly, they need to be shot, okay? But we can't do it all ourselves. This is why we bring in some of our folks. And just remember that after World War II, the greatest generation looked around and said, boy, this is a crummy world. You know, 50, 60 million dead in World War II. And said, this, this is not what we like. This is a crummy world, but like it or not, we're part of it. And they set up the United Nations. They set up NATO. And when's the first time NATO, where we were going to defend Europe, right? And when's the first time NATO goes to war? when America's attacked on 9-11. And three of the NATO nations, by the way, have lost more boys per capita than we have fighting alongside us because America was attacked. That's respect. When you see a nation willing to do that, you pay respect to them. And so it went all the way up to 49 nations fighting alongside us in Afghanistan, dropped down to 39 as we started to pull out. And now that we're, we seem to be staying, it's grown by two more nations. By the way, both the nations that have joined us in the last two years are Muslim nations, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. So we can draw a lot of people together because you are the most revolutionary na nation in the world. You Americans are the most revolutionary, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, a country that's never satisfied with itself, always finding fault with itself so we get better and better. And once in a while we have ups and downs and we get raucous, and yet the world looks to us for leadership and sometimes it comes down to some Marine or Army infantryman with a rucksack on their back with a rifle walking alongside our allies going, and going after the enemy, and that's where you come in. Uh, we can't defend this country as we saw on 9-11 if we don't show respect for our allies. It's that simple. It's real easy. Matter of fact, in 1943, all the U.S. Army guys going off to England, getting ready for the landing in Normandy, starting in 1943, got a little booklet 
about how to treat British allies. <clears throat> As you know, we were not always friends with the British, but for World War II, we were. And in the booklet, it says, it is militarily stupid to humiliate or insult your ally. One sentence sums it up, doesn't it? 1943, that's what every soldier landing in England was reading about how to act toward other human beings, okay? You don't insult other human beings who are gonna be beside you in a fight. So I'm pretty big on this. Matter of fact, it led to my resignation from my last job, and that's where I stand. I'm from the West, and I won't be trifled with. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Captain George with Marine Corps Systems Command. Mm -hmm. My question was also related to our allies. You chose to end your book with the epilogue titled America as its own ally, yeah. which the call there was to end the divisiveness of our nation, and you underscored it with the term e pluribus unum. My question is, why did you choose to end your book that way? Okay, it's a great question, and I guess this is the last question, is that right? I think that gives you the right amount of time. All right, yeah, they, they want me to do some other stuff after this, so I'll do that. So why did I end the book when I'm writing about what I learned in the Marine Corps you know, and I was an infantry officer, I wasn't some big strategist, you know, we're the ones who go in, you know, after the enemy. Why did I end it <clears throat> talking about e pluribus unum, you know, those little Latin words on that coin in our pocket, about out of many, one? <clears throat> the reason is, ladies and gentlemen, that I was gone a lot, obviously over 40 years, I deployed a lot, <clears throat> I looked forward to it, and when 9-11 happened, I spent most of my time frankly, gone or thinking about being gone or whatever. And now I'm back in a country, and now I understand when you have an election <clears throat> and I say, I'm right, he's wrong, vote for me. And in other words, it says, I'm smart, he's dumb. Okay, not always civil, that's welcome to democracy. You know, once in a while, that's what happens. We're dividing ourselves and we're voting. But then there comes a point when the election's over and you've got to start working together. Elections divide, governing, you have to unify because the founding fathers set it up with three co-equal branches of government. You must compromise, it's not a dirty word. So what you're defending right now is a country that's forgetting to compromise. That's a terrible thing if you wanna keep America alive because America can't survive without compromise. And so I wanted to put in there that, you know, let me put it in Abraham Lincoln's words. He was talking in 1858. He's not president yet, but he sees what's gonna happen if we're not careful. And he said, you, he's talking to a, what's called a young men's lyceum in 1858. And he said, you know, if all the combined armies of Asia, Europe, and Africa landed on our shores, even if they were commanded by Napoleon Bonaparte, they could never cross the Blue Ridge Mountains. We would stop them. They would never drink a drink of water out of the Ohio River. We would stop them. We're free men and women. But then he throws in a caution because he can see what's coming. And it's a little bit like Martin Luther King, by the way, 100 years later. He says, if we, if our, basically, if our experiment we call America is going to die, it will die by suicide. We'll go after each other to a point we don't show respect for each other. We'll quit being just hard on the issues. There's nothing wrong with being hard on the issues and arguing like a son of a gun with each other about education or health care, whatever the issue is, gun control, whatever it is. But if we become hard on each other and we tear this country apart and we die by suicide, that's the real threat. And I think Abraham Lincoln back in 1858, saw the real threat that we are forgetting to treat each other with respect and friendliness just because of something like we got a different political idea. Where did we ever get the idea that we're going to go after each other and destroy each other's sense of humanity, isolate each other, argue with each other and say, I will never compromise with you? Well, never compromise? Democracy is going to fail then. Ergo, it's over. What do you want, a king or do you want a dictator? I mean, what's the alternative? Like uh, the Founding Fathers said, you've got a republic if you can keep it. 
So the question now is for you young folks, can you restore a sense of humanity and friendliness among all of us? Because my generation is screwed it up. It's that simple. And I'll work with you on it, but I'm not going to be put a pretty smiley face on it either. That's why I ended the book, Captain, with that. I wanted to make certain <clears throat> that people understood that I thought that was a bigger danger. Hey, I don't, if someone wants to fight some other country, I'll fight them. I've fought all my life. You know, that's okay. I'll fight them. I tell my Canadian buddy, you know, he's a good friend, my, the Minister of Defense guy, say, hey, you want to fight? We'll fight, okay? You know, give me a break. They're our friends, you know? We, we can fight any foreign country. Do we really want to fight each other? And if you think that could never happen, then you haven't read history, because it's out there. The French army mutinied in 1961. That's not that long ago. The French army, think of that. Not our military. We'll protect this country, but what we can't do is recreate the friendliness. Why did I end a, a book about Marines like this? Two things. One, I'm in Afghanistan, I'm going from one camp to another right then, and I passed two dripping wet Marine, or Marine and say, Navy corpsmen. <clears throat> They're walking back. They've just gone into a filthy, dirty irrigation ditch, stripped their clothes off, cleaned up as best they can in a muddy ditch, put their clothes back on. They come walking out, dripping wet, and they see me. I, I, How you doing, young guys? They say, doing great, General. As the Marine put it, living the dream, you know? <laughs> filthy, dirty. And the sailor says, no Maserati, no problem, okay? So living under the worst kind of conditions, they're making light of it, they're together, they're not worried about it. These are guys who are going on patrol, taking a tourniquet and wrapping it loosely around their upper leg in case their leg gets blown off and they can snap the tourniquet shut, okay? These are young men who've learned a lot about growing up real fast. <clears throat> and they're friendly, they're together, nobody cares who goes to church, who goes to mosque or synagogue, they're together, they're tight-knit. They don't care what color each other are. They're just like the Marine Corps. And there's an example that all of you set for our country. You see what I mean? That's why I took the Marine example and ended with that kind of, that kind of talk. Because all we care about is when the chips are down, are you going to come help? Are you going to come in and fight uh, when things are going wrong? And remember this. I was out in the western Euphrates River Valley, and I won't talk after this one, General. <clears throat> And I'd stopped at, a, at an outpost where there was about 40 sailors and marines, and they're, on, they're out near a place called Haditha, but out in the desert from there, sitting right astride where the enemy foreign fighters are being brought in from Syria to go blow the hell out of uh, Baghdad. He's got to stop it, and we have these little outposts out there all on their own, and they, they're, they can't even see another outpost within range of their binoculars. They're so isolated. And so we get there around midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning. We'd had trouble getting there. And when the sun comes up, lieutenant came over to brief me, and he said, you tell me what contact they've had, how many casualties, this sort of thing. And he says, by the way, we caught a guy laying an IED on the road you were driving in on. I said, really? That's kind of personal, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> He said, what do you want to talk to him? He lived two years in London going to school, and he's been a year in Switzerland. I said, sure, bring him over. So they bring this guy over, and you can imagine what it's like for him. He's out there at night whistling, you know, digging a hole in the road, you know, putting his, he's got two artillery rounds in his wheelbarrow, a car battery. He's doing all this, and he looks up, and there's five guys with automatic rifles standing around him, you know? And he knows immediately his retirement plan is in jeopardy, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> And so he comes over, and he's, he's, he's not a real happy guy and everything, so they cut his little plastic handcuffs off, and everybody walks off except for one Lance Corporal who's guarding him. And we're sitting in the dirt there, and I said, what are you doing this for? You're a Sunni. We're the Marines. We're the only friends you got in this place. What are you trying to blow us up for? He said, oh, you Jews, you, you Americans, you're here to steal our oil. I said, really? I said, last time I checked, I pulled my wallet out every time I fill my tank with gasoline back in the States. So I'm not stealing your oil, and we don't want your country enough, you know. Uh, but I said, you're, you're a smart man. If you're going to talk like that, just go away. I'm not going to waste my time. And the Marine stepped forward to take him away, and the guy asked, can I sit here for a minute? I said, sure. So he's sitting there, and he asked for a cigarette, and I gave him one. He was shaking so bad, he couldn't, I had to light it for him. And we're talking, finally got him talking, and he said, you know, I just... 
I just hate having foreign soldiers in my country. Okay, I respect that. That I, I understand. I wouldn't want it in my country. And so, you know, getting some coffee, we're talking, where's your family? About 10 kilometers in away in Aditha. And I say, um, oh, you can leave the little one here. That's okay. <laughs> That's good to hear a little one yelling, you know? I would too if I was on a lecture this long. <laughs> um, but we're sitting there, and uh, he's got two daughters, wife over on the, on the river, a uh, little ways away. And, and he says, um, General, I guess I'm going to prison for this. I said, oh, you're lucky you're not dead for this little stunt. But yeah, you're going to Abu Ghraib, and you're going to be wearing an orange jumpsuit for a good long time. You're, but uh, consider yourself fortunate. You get your head blown off. And he said, now listen to this. Everybody listen to me now. Here's a guy who's trying to kill us, OK? And he said, General, do you think if I'm a model prisoner that I could immigrate to America someday? Now think about that, that he would give anything to be sitting right where you're sitting right now so his two daughters could go to school in this country. He would have done a, here's a guy who's so hateful that he's trying to kill us at that moment and the power of America's inspiration could reach halfway around the world. So you remember that you represent still the best country in the world, the best shot the world has at a better life. And in our worst day, when we're pretty dissatisfied with a lot of things perhaps in this country, there are people who would give anything to bring their family over here and be sitting right where we're sitting. It's just a reminder each day to be grateful for what we have. Let me just tell you, I'm grateful to be in Quantico with you today and no gun, I'm happy I outrank gunnery sergeants now because they still scare the dickens out of me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, but thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah.